Hey folks, welcome back to our third day of CDA live stream webinars. Our last live stream, we talked about base management for advanced users. Today, we're going to be talking about post calibration tweaks or post calibration results and what to do after you run your room correction. In this particular case, we're going to be talking about DRAC. We've got Matthew Trinkline from Storm Audio. We've got Anthony Gamani, and we have Matthew Pose. How are you guys doing? Good. Excellent. Good. Awesome. So yeah, this is a question that comes up a lot. I get people that run automatic room correction and they're like, can I trust the results? Am I done? Do I hit the red button and everything's great? Anthony Gramani, you tell me, is that always the case? Can one button solve everything? Um, so in the, we were talking about myths in the last session. No, that's, that's unfortunately a myth. Um, and it's a myth because there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of, a lot of issues that go on acoustically and psychoacoustically in a room that either automated systems or manual systems in which you only look at a screen cannot tell you all fully accurately. I, I actually like to say that doing an EQ either by you know pushing a button or you know plugging your ears and just using a computer to look at a at a curve is kind of like taking a really nice expensive cut of let's just use fish to be kind of politically correct a Chilean sea bass right out of the freezer, throwing it in the microwave, hit the button and hope that you're going to have a nice dinner. It's not going to work. No. You'll have food. You'll get food. It's not going to be really good food. What you need to do is what we're going to talk about here, which is you got to tune it. You got to use the tools, you know, and then you got to use these tools and you got to listen and you got to know what to listen for uh, to get to, you know, audioholic nirvana. I like that. Awesome. Well, right, I'm going Anthony, to share. We, go ahead. Well, go ahead and share it, but I'll just mention, Anthony, you and I have talked about this before too. Occasionally, in these automated systems, something goes wrong. And so sometimes you do have to go back and make sure you're doing those double checks post calibration to make sure that things didn't go wrong. Because you, you've shown me some that were quite bizarre before, and I've certainly had a few too, where clearly it didn't get a good reading and I need to redo it. Um, and occasionally, the things that throw it off are actually some of the calibration you have to do. So it's, I don't know if it's post pre, but like, you know, you figure out yep. the problem afterwards, you go back in, you make some changes, and you redo the process. Right. To add on, to add on that, I'd say it's a little bit more often than occasionally to the point where, you know, you need to actually go in and, and do some verification while you're in the process. You know, for example, Dirac Live uses its first measurement position to coordinate your delays and levels. So my common practice is after I take the first measurement, I go into the next step, which is the design, and take a look at my, my impulse and my frequency response and make sure you don't see anything crazy because you could have something wrong on the very first measurement and then, you know, go on and do a, a series more of them and all you're doing is adding to the problem. You know, I've seen yeah. on some on the back side where you know, you do a really quick down and dirty just to get an approximation and then it comes out and says, oh, your, you know, subwoofer is a 200 millisecond delay. And you say, well, there's no way that that's physically right. possible. So. So one thing I'd like to interject is maybe a way to avoid some of these errors is at least get an, a, a decent setup going before you run the auto room correction. Get your subwoofers properly placed. And potentially you might have to flip the phase on one sub to get the best integration in your seat. If you could do that prior to running the room EQ, I think it, you stand a better chance of getting better results. Would you guys agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. I always, I always, when I'm talking about direct with people or any automation process, I always say, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a computer program. The less work you give it to do, the better job it can do. Right. Um, yeah. I, I speak a lot in analogies, and I think it helps me understand and helps other people understand. Painting, we've all had to paint a wall or paint a car or paint something. The quality of the result is all based on the prep. You got to spend a lot of time getting the surfaces all prepped, everything ready. Any of you guys who try to paint something, you know what I'm talking about. And it's the same thing here. If you start with a good foundation of a room that's got properly placed loudspeakers, the right kind of loudspeakers, the right acoustics, the right everything, then the measurement system, whether it's manual or automated, gives what it's actually giving you is less flawed and it's more like what you really hear and then you'll have to do less work later and second guessing it. So it is it is all in the prep. Uh, it's really important to get it done right. I also like to say trust but verify. So we're going to we're going to go over this and you know we we've all done this where we run an automation system if it's a, the automated ones uh, that 
are the better ones, but we always come back and remeasure it quickly with the manual scheme to go, hey, did this did this yield the right result? Kind of like cutting, if you're doing woodwork, you cut the piece of wood and then you measure again. Did I cut it right? Somehow it never cuts right. I don't know what it is. It's always yeah, off. True. Okay, let's recut it. Um, um, that's really the way to think of it over here. So that's a long answer from all three of us that you can't just hit the magic button and expect it to come out perfect every time. Right, right. All right, so let's proceed here. Proceeding. So I've got a little, you know, set of slides. Um, and with introductions, I'm here, Anthony Grabati from Grabati Systems. Matthew Trinkline is joining us from Storm Audio. Matthew Pose is over here from Pose Acoustics. And then Gene De La Sala, which I just realized I misspelled. Sorry, Gene. Uh, oh, that's it, all right. That's close. It's close. There's most mostly all the same things. And and he's simply the boss, okay? Uh, that's that's what we're here for. So um, I do want to say that if you're going to do, so what we're here to talk about is the calibration process, which is you've brought a bunch of gear into the room, you've hooked it all up, and now you're tuning it so that it sounds amazing. And the steps of calibration are not just hitting that proverbial button, which whichever one of the automation systems it is. The steps are first, configuration, make sure all the components are set and configured for what they're supposed to be doing. Is it the right type of input? Is it the right type of base um, base management if you're using different crossovers and filters? A, a, a lot of different things need to be configured and a lot of people forget that. So I'll, I'll go places where like, oh, that sounds not very good. I don't really know. And I'll start looking around the menus after somebody's done an, a calibration. And I notice that the, the crossover settings are have never been set or are wrong. I'll notice that the output configuration of source devices are still, still stuck in two-channel PCM. So you're trying to listen to Atmos, yep. but the source device is turning everything down res into two-channel stereo. So everything you're hearing is left and right. And then to get some sense of spaciousness, the clients press the five-channel stereo button. So now it's coming out of everywhere all the time. That's all just or the up mixer. They think or the Atmos mixer. is the Adobe surround up mixer. Right. <laughs> So configuration number one, verification that all of the products are working. And it, it, every one of these topics, normally when I do a, cal a calibration course, is ours. So verification that all the speakers are working, the amps are working, the wires are right, everything's polarized correctly, everything is going where it's supposed to be going, the speakers are aimed correctly, the subwoofers are in the right place. That's, when I do a calibration, that's actually sometimes half of the time, the combination of verification and debugging. Um, can take one day out of the two days of a calibration process. Why? Because there's a lot of things interconnected, a lot of components. And the more you have connections and components, the more there's a chance that things will go wrong. Um, and the nasty little statistic is after about calibrating about a thousand rooms so far, there hasn't been one where the verif verification process did not require some debugging and fixes. I don't know if you, if, I, if that makes sense. I have never yeah. been in a room built by either me or somebody else in which before being able to tune and calibrate, there, there wasn't some debucking and fixing needed first. And you go, well, how's that possible? Well, there's a lot of things connected. So then finally, you can do some equalization, whether you're doing it manually or with an automated device. Then you do some level and time synchronization by ear. So. I'm going to go over this. There's a place at which the, the measurement system is going to get you close, but not perfect. And I'm going to show you how to get it to where it's perfect. And then finally, you do listening tests. And if you if you guys are either professional calibrators or your techs or, you know, you should plan on a good two to three hours of listening tests at a bunch of different program material, test tones and program material at the end. After you've used all the mics, you put them all away and you listen for certain things. And that's what we're going to talk about over here. What are you listening for? How do you make sure you get it right? So the overview of this webinar is quick overview of, of equalization. Uh, a discussion of level and time synchronization and the listening tests. So first off, what's the reference? Where, what are we trying to get to? Good sound. Yeah, well, what's good sound? What does that mean? In, if we're talking about home cinemas, uh, if we're talking about movie theater sound, there are references. There's a certain sound quality and character you should get to. And that's the sound character you get in what's called a, a mix room or a dubbing stage is the real term. Uh, there's a picture of one of the dubbing stages at Skywalker Sound, pretty close to here in the Lucasfilm headquarters. There are documented standards. There are practices everybody uses in designing and building and calibrating those. You can read those. Um, 
if uh, we talked in the last webinar about AES papers being kind of um, cure for, for insomnia. You can also read the ISO 2969X or the SIMT 2002N documents. If, if the other ones don't put you to sleep, this will put you to sleep. It's heavy duty engineering stuff that defines all this stuff, all the, the design characteristics, okay? So now, the first thing you should do when, when you just hook everything up before you hit any buttons on any calibration system is listen to a bit of program material, listen to known material, some two-channel and some multi-channel, and like listen to what it's sounding like in the beginning, right? You just, you're starting to cook this giant dish called the home cinema audio package. Well, what's it starting at? I know you could say, well, you haven't tuned anything. What are you listening for? It's like, you're getting familiar with the room, the speakers, what's what's happening, and you're also recompensing yourself along the way as you're fixing things that, oh, it sounds better, oh, it sounds better. And in the end, you'll start to develop this very intuit, intuitive and in, intimate sense of what the room is doing to where in seven hours, you can actually give yourself the, the right to tune something by one dB because you really know what's going on in there. So it starts with the initial listening test. Um, well, it, and Anthony, if I can stop you for a second, I you might go through this as well, but for others who have had my pain, I'll sometimes, because what you're talking about is setting the baseline in your head of what the system yeah. sounds like. Exactly. And then as I'm moving through and making changes, it'll be like, oh, it sounds better. Well, if that was good, let's try a little more. No, that's worse. And then there's times where you'll get yourself so far down a rabbit hole that you've got to start over. You've got to pull back. And so that spending a lot of time getting that baseline right is really important for yep. one thing to know what you can pull back to if you do go too far down a certain road with especially things like the time alignment. That's an easy one to, to yeah. good, good, good. Oh, no, yeah. it's terrible now. Yep. Yeah. It's This is just like cooking, you know? Oh, needs a little more salt. Oh, yeah, that's better. Oop, too much. Except that in cooking, you can't come back. Once you put too much salt in it, you're that done, right? Can you add more sugar? Is that going to fix it? Um, add more liquid if it's a soup. Add more liquid, exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I mentioned, it, you know, what are you listening for? It's actually kind of nice to be procedural. And I, I actually have a form in which I am, I'm not just listening, but I'm paying attention to these eight things and I write them down. How clear is the dialogue and the articulation? I call dialogue people speaking articulation. I kind of mentioned, I got to think of it as like singers singing in program material. Can you actually hear the different instruments? Um, how good or how bad is the sound localization? And in the beginning, it's probably going to be that. You know, there you're going to, it's going to be a very vague sound field. You should note, yep, I couldn't, I couldn't hear the differences between this and that. Uh, how spacious is the surround field? You'll notice in the beginning, it all sounds like individual speakers without an integration. Um, how good are the sound movements? You know, when things are supposed to move evenly through the sound field, do they move evenly or do they just pop from speaker to speaker or just disappear? Uh, how good is the tonal balance? Is the bass, mid, treble balance right? Chances are it'll be absolutely horrible. How good are the dynamics? The sense that there's a good difference between the peaks and the quiets, you'll probably notice that it's not right. And overall, this is a very esoteric sense, is the system transparent? As in, and I'm, am I no longer listening to amplifiers and speakers, but I'm actually listening right into the program material? In the beginning, all of this probably has really bad grades. And mm -hmm. I physically have a checkbox for all of those with a, with a number from one to 10, like, you know, what do I, I evaluate that? And as you go through, you keep doing the listening and it, you know, it should get better, right? So. Um, another thing I like to do is to listen to this at all the seats in the room. So this takes a while, right? It shouldn't just sound good at one seat. It should sound good everywhere. And if you have to make compromises so that it sounds maybe not as perfect at one seat, but it smooths out in the other ones, you got to ask the owner uh, if that's what they that's where they're hoping to go. Well, that's the designated mother-in-law seat. Right. <laughs> that's the bad what? one. The one you don't want to compromise is the, the master listening position, that main area. That's the right. one usually you want to put the most into. You, you do. If the client says, I don't have a master uh, client user or yourself says, I don't really have a master position. I may sit here. I may sit there. Another day I may sit there. Then you, you got to average it out. Yeah, average it out. I actually have a client who prefers to listen way off axis. And, you know, he's. A, I told him that's not a good place to sit and listen, but that's what he wants. So for him, I actually had to make sure that I could optimize it for a pretty bad position. Wow. So why? Do, so let's let's pause and talk. Why does he want to listen way off axis? Uh, it is um, a convenience thing. So it's, okay. he's got a very good system set up in a normal living room. Yep. Uh, the room is somewhat treated, um, but yep. it's got a couch, and then it's got two chairs on either side. The okay. couch would be the 
main listening position if you wanted to, to, have to be optimal. But he feels comfortable in the rightmost recliner. Okay. So I've offered for him to move things around to get better sound, but that's not what he wants. So we've just modified the speaker positions and the and the calibration to make it so it sounds decent. It's not perfect. It's right. a huge compromise, but it's as good as it can be for sitting way off like that. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because you you, you need to know. Now there are amazing things you can do with optimization of delays, bass management, and all that to make that seat that's not in the middle sound the best. Um, and, and also, I, I do want to mention, I've never really brought this up, but sometimes the audibility of effects going around you is better off axis. When you're right in the middle of it all, it actually can start to sound like this giant cloud of sound where you're not really sure where it is. And you move a little bit over there and you can clearly tell where things are going because you are you have actually decorrelated the characteristics of all of the different directions and it's more audible. But I was curious what your client's rationale was, and that's a good one. You know, it's just convenience. Yeah, I, I apologize, Anthony. I have to get going. I was only okay. able to join a little bit for this one, but I hope you guys have fun with the rest of it. Thank you. Thank, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, when when I Matthew really. said convenience, I was wondering if it well, yeah, it was closer to to where the chocolate is right there. You know, because it's all <laughs> yeah. or the or short the shorter walk to the, the fridge is right here, Anthony. It's right here, <laughs> right for you, right there. Thank you, thank you, Gene. Um, Okay, so um, now after you have done the EQ, I'm, I'm kind of skipping. I'm going, okay, so yeah. you, you do all the tuning. It's, it's all done and you go, I don't know. It doesn't sound very good. It's I, you know, the, I, I'm now listening to these eight elements. I'm like, ah, I don't know. Well, first thing to do is, hey, how is this room working? Let's say you w were brought in to do a calibration and you don't know anything about the acoustics or anything about the room, well, you should verify if there's any problems with it. I, I always love to just walk around the room, clap my hands and hear if there's any strong flutter echoes. What's called a flutter echo is the sound bouncing back and forth between hard surfaces. Whether they're parallel or not, this is one of the myths we talked about an hour ago, is even non-parallel walls can actually have a slap echo that crawls down the room. So. If you have strong echoes in the room, that will sit all over all your program material and a lot of things are just not gonna sound so good and you gotta hear them. And if there are echoes, you, you're gonna have to fix them. You may never be able to get to a point where the sound, you know, through any kind of tweaking of the equalization or anything else, you may not be able to fix that. Um, another thing that can happen in a room is there can be boundary reflection. So let's say you have a room in which there's a speaker over here and very close to it is a, is a window or a hard wall without any treatment. Um, there may be uh, what's called a comb filter, which is the sound from the speaker goes to you directly. The sound off the surface bounces off and gets there a little later and there's some errors in the response. And you may not see those errors in your measurement because it may be really tightly grouped, but it sounds bad. One of my favorite things to do is to play pink noise at that speaker, move my head back and forth, and hear if I notice comb filters. Comb filters would go as you move back and forth, as you're shortening the distance and increasing the distance to that reflection. If that's there, you can sit there and spin your wheels, trying to adjust this and trying to adjust that and never quite get to that nirvana point. Um, so that's the idea over here. Listen to pink noise and whatever speaker you think there may be a reflection, move your head back and forth, listen to phasey sound. Um, there's a, uh, the Atmos disc has, uh, there's, a, there's a demo disc that Dolby issues to its licensees that if you can get your hands on one of those, there's pink noise in each one of the channels of a typical Atmos system. And you can just play it over there and go, hey, what does that sound like? Okay, next thing I like to do post EQ or post auto EQ is let's check and see that the thing came up with all the same right levels. So the fact that the microphone and the measurement device said, oh, th this is what it takes for them to all be equal doesn't mean that your ear brain is gonna hear it that way. And we're gonna talk later a bit about the psychoacoustics of this, but listen for that. Uh, you know, if it's not quite sounding right, start off by maybe using the internal test tones of a surround decoder because they all have that and just play them around the room, just going, you know, left, center, right, side, right, back, right, back, left, all the way around the room. And just by ear, does it sound the same? Um, in, you know, we have Matthew with us here from Storm Audio and in the Storm Audio decoder that's very sophisticated in the test tones, you have the choice of either mid-range uh, pink noise, which is really useful for measurement-based uh, uh, 
result for checking through measurements that the levels are all the same it also has wideband pink noise you can choose which type you have and i would recommend starting a circle of of uh, of listening tests with mid-band pink noise so that's typically 500 hertz to two kilohertz and then go to wideband and listen to how the sound cha sound changes as you move around ultimately all the channels should sound like about the same level and you will find very often whether whether it's Dirac or any of the other um, measurement methods, you'll actually find it doesn't sound the same. It measures the same, but the way your ear brain hears it or notices it may not be the same, and you may need to tweak by a few dB here or there to make it be the same. Anthony, so if I could, uh, if I could make a, a little comment on that too, especially because we just finished our, our segment on bass management. You know, the other thing that's nice about being able to have a, a band limited pink noise is to make sure that your bass management isn't in play and that your subwoofers aren't, you know, skewing what you're verifying. Right. So if you have bass management issues to where one speaker has a big bump in the bass response at 200 hertz, that that's just going to give you more level as measured by the meter. But in the mid-range where your ear really hears the sense of loudness, it doesn't change it. Meanwhile, the meter said, oh, that channel is about 2 dB louder because there's a bass bump over it. It doesn't know why. It's just 2 dB louder. It's going to turn that channel down. And when you go and listen around the room, it's like, why is that Why is that channel quieter by 2 dB? I don't know. Turn it back up. So this is the typical spectrum of mid-frequency pink noise that is in just about every surround decoder out there. Uh, and like I mentioned on the storm, you can actually adjust that whether you want it full band, low frequency only, yeah. full range, single tone, you can do all these different choices. So Anthony, that's a great point you bring up because I don't know how much you remember back in the day, back in my day, but when the older receivers came out, they were not doing bandwidth limited pink noise on, the, on a lot of the test tones and you could not get accurate channel to channel trims because it would factor the bass in for whatever that channel yeah. was playing. So yeah. doing the broadband pink noise is not really the best way to, to match all your channel levels. Yeah, yeah. If you if you are using a meter, whether it's an actual meter you're holding in your hand or the meter built into an EQ scheme, right. it's got to be using narrow band pink noise. We're only looking at the mid range and mid mid band pink mid base pink noise has been in surround decoders since 1987 in the great majority of them. So if a few people had a wide band pink noise, which they still do. Um, that was their choice, but both Dolby and THX have have specified that it should be mid range only because that's the right thing to be using. Yeah. Um, so next thing on the level calibration is you know where do you find that? It's either under channel level, speaker levels, different decoders have it in a different place. It's usually set up for for a target of 75 dB SPL with the volume at the reference position. If you're going to use an SPL meter, don't stick it here because that's not where you're listening it should be at ear ear height and usually hold it at arm's length over the seating position or put it on a microphone stand um but don't just rely on what the meter says even a top of the line five thousand dollar brulin care completely certified perfect meter is ultimately measuring on an omnidirectional microphone that picks up the sound from everywhere and feeds it down into the anal analysis system without any of the psychoacoustic filtering and it may say that the level is the same and by ear you could put three people right in the in the seat position and everybody would agree yeah that channel's quiet and quiet by just 2 db or a db but in when you're trying to build something that sounds you know just perfect where the where the immersion is totally seamless 2 db errors is way too much yeah. so listen all the way around use the meter and listen use the meter and listen um okay let's uh, move along over here yeah so what we want to really focus on in the remainder of this is what do you do after the audio eq is run look at the base management settings do you trust it uh do you trust the eq do you want to limit the bandwidth of correction um right Kind of, I guess, what's your thoughts on that? So yeah, we're going to get there. Absolutely, you you got to you got to verify trust, but verify it did the the right thing. So one of the things that auto EQ schemes do on a lot of them is they they try on their own to decide where they're going to put the crossover, and sometimes that's not right. They may actually have a setting of LFE, the out low frequency effects channel on its own, that's wrong relative to the other ones. You should verify that. Let's say that your LFE. Uh, somewhere in the configuration was turned down 10 dB because a lot of manufacturers have that adjustable. And it all sounds great on music. Then you switch over to something that's got loud effects in the LFE only. Suddenly they're 10 dB quiet. I'm like, what's going on? I don't, I don't hear this. So then you crank the subwoofers up 
to compensate. But now when there's bass in the main channel, it's blowing you out of your seat, but the LFE is quiet. So along the way, please do verify that either the manually set configuration or the auto set configuration, the LFE is at the right level. And the right way to do that um, is, uh, boy, I had it in there. There are different test disks out there. I issued one several years ago with Goldline called the TK51, which you can still buy, that has a test signal in it for of the same value in LFE and in the center channel. It's actually offset by 10 dB, but it should come out at the same level. And you measure it, you listen to that rumble of low frequency, and it should be the same. You'd be amazed how often I find that to be wrong. Hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this frequency response calibration, also known as EQ. As a reminder, that gets done by one of many different ways, either real-time analysis, impulse response, transfer function, different. There's different methodologies within REW that we talk about a lot. Uh, you actually have the choice. The different auto EQ schemes out there do it differently. Some of them just rely on a, on a real-time analysis with, with a fast Fourier transform. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. They're, they're gonna do what they're gonna do the right way. You always wanna use spatial averaging, so multiple microphones. Uh, you wanna have a resolution of at least 12th octave. And with REW, what you're looking at, uh, there's a function called psychoacoustic smoothing that actually gives you a result on the screen that matches what you're hearing. Um, so sometimes there's peaks and dips that are really, really sharp, really narrow. You don't really hear those. What you want is, is this model that matches what the ear says. Um, now, if possible, before you start doing any real serious uh, di digital signal processing based correction. If you have the option and you can move speakers or seats around like we talked about in the last session, try to do so. See if, hey, by moving the seat over here, I can get be better sound quality or better measurements. Uh, because if you can, uh, like we said right in the beginning here, if you can optimize the room, the environment within which the room is and where the microphones are, the system will work better. Um, and when you're equalizing, whether it's auto or manual, there is a concept of a target curve, which is what should the microphones be measuring uh, and the analysis system be analyzing for so that it matches what we think sounds good. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about this because we don't have time. This is a reminder of the fact that Whatever measurements you're doing, you should always measure at least four microphone locations, whether it's by taking a microphone and moving it around, or preferably having four mics that you plug into a four channel USB interface or what's called a multiplexer, a device that switches between the four. It's a lot more effective to put the four mics down and leave them at the right locations. Um, so I'm gonna bypass this so that we can keep moving. So Anthony, yeah. how do you feel about full bandwidth correction? In your calibrations, do you do full bandwidth or do you Absolutely. limit it to, you do, okay. Absolutely, you you do need to look at full band correction. And for a long, long time, everybody said, you know, I should only correct below 500 Hertz. The room's really dominant below 500 Hertz. Nothing matters above that. And that's not true. And it's not true because there's a lot of, First, there's a lot of speakers out there that don't have flat response, right? You know, take them out of the box, hang them on the wall, put them on a stand. And the actual design of the speaker was not flat response. You're going to hear that. You need to measure that. You should measure that in the near field. Find out what the speaker is doing at about three feet from it, either outside or in the room. And that's tricky, though. Out. That's tricky with large speakers that have big arrays that don't sum correctly at three feet, though. Yeah. Well, you can move back to six feet. You're still within, largely within the dominant, uh, yeah. within the the direct field dominance. And and if you're mainly paying attention to the stuff around one kilo above one kilohertz, you, you should start off with something that's pretty smooth. That's one. Number two, the reason to do full band is if you assume that the speaker sound power response, we're going to talk about that pretty soon. If you assume that what it's radiating in the room is the same at all frequencies, and you assume that the room's reflection character is the same at all frequencies, then you could argue, I only need to correct for what's errors in the standing wave region and the low frequency. And those two assumptions are impossible 99% of the time. Most rooms have their own character and how they decay sound differently at different frequencies. And most speakers radiate differently at different frequencies. So what you're gonna be hearing and measuring is gonna change depending on the character of the reflection energy in the room. And for that reason, you do wanna take it all the way up. And sometimes it's not narrow band corrections, but you may need to tilt um, 
Matt, I can hear your HVAC. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I was wondering whether I, I thought that was me with, with that sound, but it's Matt's. <laughs> okay. How's that? Um, now That's Matt's going to start sweating. I don't want you to sweat. You can just mute your mic if you're not. Oh, talking. no. We're, we're okay. Uh, we're lucky enough I'm uh, far enough away from the fires. It's not affecting yeah. us that badly. Okay. Matt, for all of you guys uh, watching this, Matthew Trinklin is very close, well, far away enough, but in the general region where there's these massive California fires and Ouch. Man, it's like, ah. Uh, um, it's so, heartbreaking. Uh, where, where I was going is because speakers don't have uniform sound power or off axis reflection character, and rooms don't have even reflection character, you may need to adjust mid and, and high frequency tilts and tilts, broadband yeah. adjustments to compensate for that. It's not narrow band things, but you do need to look at it all the way up. So you so, kind of want to, you yeah. want to follow this kind of curve, right, Anthony? Uh, yeah, hold on. This is interesting. You might have even have a slide like that. Oh, did you bring that up? I, I brought that up. Uh, okay. Sorry. It was like, Hey, what's going on? Yes. So that's <laughs> what's coming up right now. So first off in all your work, whether you're doing manual EQ and what I call manual EQs, you put microphones down, you're measuring it with an analysis system, which again, the, to me, the best value today is room EQ wizard. It's a free download, but please do give them a $50 or a hundred dollar donation for the work they do. It's yeah. amazing. It's well worth it. They deserve it. Uh, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and they're constantly working on it and updating it and improving it too. So you can also, if you sign up, it'll always give you a notification when the latest beta firmware yeah. version is available. There's updates all the time. So we we found a little bug in their new new four microphone and put an optimization, like a little thing. And our chief engineer sent a little email within an hour. It was fixed. The guy's in England. He fixed it. Boom, done. It works. Like, wow. That's crazy. Um, so you are EQing for a target curve. It's not a flat response. That target curve is a pretty universally accepted shape for what sounds right when you when you measure with an omnidirectional microphone. It's actually not what you're going to hear, but it's what a microphone would measure so that it sounds right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And remember, a, 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 I've got a test microphone over here. It's pretty pretty standard one, omnidirectional device. This is going to pick up all the energy all the way around it evenly. It's going to be measured universally. And that is not the same as our ears that are stuck on our head with a little horn on them and collecting the sound and the psychoacoustic reflection cancellation that's built right into our brain. It doesn't measure and hear the same way. But if you essentially distort the target results to have this, this target curve I'm about to bring up, you, you will end up most of the time going, yeah, that sounds good. So. Uh, now, the reason it doesn't always work, I, I, let me put it this other way. The target curve is right if you speak, I wrote this wrong. If you're using speakers that have non-flat sound power, if, you're, if your rooms are not flat reflection, it may or may not work right. So you got to take that with a grain of salt, okay? Sure. So the ideal room it, or the ideal system is one in which you have speakers that have really smooth sound power. The, the, the spectral character in all directions is the same. Doesn't mean they're radiating equally everywhere, but everything that's going this way and that way and this way has the same response. One, two, the room reflects it evenly at all frequencies, which doesn't mean it's reflecting everything, but the amount of absorption and diffusion is even across all frequencies. If you do that, then the target curve is going to yield the right results. Uh, there's a lot of variables, and that's what we're here to talk about. So this is a very rough graph of a target curve. Um, generally, it's a, it's a target response in which things in the mid-frequency are pretty smooth. So this is, about, this is at about 200 hertz, and that's at about 5 to 6 kilohertz. So, sometimes a slight downward tilt but it's basically smooth over here. Then at low frequency, you should expect a little bit of rise, about four or five dB, starting at about 150 Hertz, rising up a little bit. Um, and then at high frequency, you should expect to see a droop off. That doesn't mean you're hearing that that way. It just means that, that again, I'm gonna keep saying, that is what a omnidirectional test measurement microphone should be receiving so that in the end, 10 people with good hearing can go, yep, that sounds good. It's basically you have about a 10 dB gain of bass at 20 hertz versus 20 kilohertz, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. Right. That's, a, that's the overall range. Like this. So, yep. Now, this is not my opinion. 
This is their opinion of people with doctorates who studied this over and over and over and over and over and over again. They wrote papers, more AES papers. If you want to read them, you can do it. It may put you asleep, all this other stuff. But I, I happen to agree with this. Why? Because I've tuned about 500 rooms on that target curve. It's like, yeah, that sounds really good. Okay. Yeah. So um, that that is, you know, a really crucial in the process. Now, here's a here's a random result of a room we equalized recently that was on the target curve. Now, uh, gentle downward slope, a bit of gain below 150 hertz, drop off above six kilohertz. There you go. But how does it sound? Does it always sound perfect? Matthew, you've done more than one of these. Gene, you've done more than one of these. Um, in the process that Matthew's company um, sells, you can draw in a target curve. You can say, this is what I'm trying to get. Uh, in the measurements and equalization gene that you've done, you know to draw a target curve. You look at that on the computer, you go, I got a perfect target curve. Let's put this aside and listen to my favorite music and films. Does it right. always sound perfect? No. No, never. Usually it's a starting point. Too, yeah, usually the base is too thin. Base is too thin. Be. That's because you're a baseaholic. I, I am a baseaholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, often often the base is a little thin. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just right. Um, but yeah, often it's thin. Um, what what else do you guys notice? Sometimes I mean sometimes it really depends on the source. Sometimes I notice the highs are a little diminished. I mean, but then again, I don't hear as good as I did when I was in my twenties. So. Sometimes I like to EQ my speakers maybe almost flat to 20K rather than having that gentle roll off. Okay. Yeah. It depends on the it, room it, acoustics. It largely depends on the room acoustics. I time sometimes that, you know, as Gene just said, really opening up the, the high end. I don't run them, you know, totally flat all the way up to 20, but I'll shift my, my roll off points and, you know, how far out I stretch them and how low I bring them down. Um, normally I'm targeting for, you know, around minus four and a half, minus five dB at anywhere from 16 to 18 Hertz. I may bring that up. The other thing that I find sometimes it really helps is adjusting how steep I'm rolling off, you know, from one kilohertz up to that point. I might want to hold it pretty flat up to 8K for one room and then let it start to fall off because it's just giving me a lot better presentation. All right. Yeah, really, it really depends on the RT60 decay time in the room, too. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree, Anthony, on how you would it, perceive it the highs? It depends on the reflection decay character of the room, not just the length of it, but the balance across frequencies. So let's say you have a room that's got really live high frequency, like there's, it's reflecting all the highs. Well, that, that's going to sustain more of the highs in the room, and it's going to sound high frequency emphasized. Um, and it depends on the sound power of the speaker, which is the jet, the net energy of the speaker being sent into the room. So let's look at that. How does it sound? So um, let's let's be fair. When you're listening to a speaker in a room, there's a combination of sounds going into your ear canal, perceived inside your auditory system, and then sent to your brain for like, yeah, you're listening to Beethoven or Motley Crue. Um, so there's a direct sound that's going from the speaker to your ear and you, you're hearing that. And then pretty soon after that, you know, a few milliseconds behind that or several milliseconds, there's a sound that is radiating off axis of the speaker. In this case, I've got like 15 degrees off axis that misses your head. And it goes, whoop, bounces off the back wall in here, bounces back front wall, bounces around, goes around and then finally hits you after five or six bounces, maybe 50 milliseconds later. There's another sound that's maybe at 20 degrees off axis that bounces two or three times before it hits you. There's another sound over here that bounces off. There's another one. There's another one. There's one that's going to just bounce off the wall one, one path and hit you maybe a few milliseconds later. There's a lot of bounces. And the, the net total of that on the right side of the room shows a bunch of red arrows over here. So there's one blue arrow of the direct sound from the speaker to you. And then there's a bunch of red arrows of everything that's flying off the right wall of this room. And then you add the left wall of the room and you go, wow, there's a lot of these red arrows hitting you. And all of those are a little quieter than the direct sound. They're all a little bit later. But the total sum of that red pool of sound is sometimes 3 dB louder, 3 dB higher in energy than the direct sound. 3 dB, three times, sorry, 10 dB louder. Yeah, that's so that we need room, means room treatments help. Room treatments reduce that. You don't want to kill them all. But that does mean that what's going into your ear canal is completely and largely dominated by the reflected field of the room. 
And the reflected field of the room is a combination of the off-axis response of the speaker. So what it's generating over the whole room and what's bouncing around the room, whether there are drapes, whether a hard wall, a, an open archway, all of that is what's contributing to what's going into your ear canal. And all of that is things that measurement systems don't really know how to discriminate. There are some where the more sophisticated ones go and they increasingly uh, um, narrow down the measurement window so that you're getting more and more direct sound at high frequency, uh, which helps. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do, to do these measurements so that it's more like the ear brain hears, but none of it so far can hear just like the ear brain of a human being does. And that's because you're mainly, what's mainly hitting your ear canal, the entrance of your, your, uh, your ear canal is mainly reflected energy. And our brain discriminates between the direct sound and the reflected sound in a different way than microphones and analyzers do. So how does it sound? The target curve is the right direction. You know, like, like Matthew said, it's a step in the right direction um, and it is a good step in the right direction. To be fair, I have tuned rooms where there was nothing else needed than just get it right on the target curve. And it sounded great. Everybody that came and listened to thought it sounded great. Uh, this last thing I said is really important because there's people going, well, you like it one way, I like it a different way. She likes it a different way. It's like, I haven't found that. I've actually found that if there's three or four people around available, when I'm getting finished with calibration, I go, hey, come over here. Tell me what you think of this versus this versus this. And most listeners agree. And that's mm -hmm. the work that Dr. Floyd Tool has done over the years is go, you know, more people agree to the quality of sound than disagree. Yeah, there are some disagreements, but by and large, most people statistically agree that sounds better. So the target well, curve. Well, one thing I want to interject is, yes, you can get this perfect target curve and it sounds good uh, most of the time, but source material really varies oh, yeah. in base response. Yes. So you, it is oh, yeah. important to have the ability to raise the subwoofer levels. A absolutely. That's a, that's a whole other issue. Let's talk about it. So in the film business, there is a pretty standardized character for the target curve in the mix room. And there's a pretty standardized <laughs> Uh, aesthetic for how you mix a film soundtrack. So as you go through different film soundtracks, let's say you play 20 different film soundtracks, you may hear some slight differences in spectral balance. Some may have a little more low end than others, but they'll be generally pretty even. You do the same thing with program material and it's all over the board. Some tracks will be really bright. Some of, some of them will be really dull. They'll, some of them will have incredible bass. Some will be really bass shy. And that's that's two things, Gene and Matthew. It's taste, you know, and, and taste that has evolved over time. The older program material, if you listen to your favorite rock tracks or, oh, or even classical tracks from 40 years ago, yeah. they're all bass shy by today's oh my standards. God, yeah. It's and, funny because I'll give you a perfect example, a modern example. If you guys stream Atmos on Tidal or Apple Music, go put on a Billie Eilish Atmos mix. And first of all, her mixes are incredible. The bass is just right there pounding deep then go put on porcupine tree one of my favorite bands and then there's no bass right. and then you're just like your heart just melt it, it just right. drops and, and por <laughs> porcupine tree was extremely well mastered and yeah. engineered uh by i'm forgetting his name Stephen oh my god wilson Stephen. thank wilson. you yep. but it's 25 years old now right yeah yep and and then you go back even further to all of the tracks we all Our grew genesis, up genesis like, oh yes elp and it, and it's like Where's the low end, man? That thing used to be thunderous. No, not anymore. Yeah. And it's fine. It's fine. But if you want to maintain some uh, consistency in the experience, you do need that bass and treble control. And you know what? A lot of processors don't have that anymore. So yes. free plug, free plug to Storm in their control panel. After you've equalized everything we're going to talk about, there's a place you can go and go, I want a little more treble. I want a little more bass, less bass, less treble. And you can still play with it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and, and you could do that, and you could do that in the phone app. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Somebody, somebody was really smart about it and decided to call them per listening content editors, so that they yep. actually, when you turn the system off or go to a different source input, they get wiped. They're reset. It zeros out as yep. they should be. Yep. Because it is per listening. Uh, oh mode. wait a minute! They do reset when you turn the processor on and off. There uh, and depends on what your circumstance is, but yeah. Okay, I haven't I haven't checked that. So, getting back to this target curve, and this is basically what we've been saying is the target the typical target curves you'll see out there published the ones I'm showing over here, they're a, a step in the right direction. Uh, 
but understand that our, our ear brain system, like the combination of the, the actual mechanical device, the neurological device and the interpretation device, hears and interprets direct sound, early reflections and late reflections, also known as sound power, differently mm -hmm. than test microphones and analyzers. So um, that's where it's time to do some listening. So here's a few tricks. One of my favorite things to do when I first get done with all this, you know, I draw a target curve. I whip this out. Um, it's a, a product uh, called the Etimotic ER4S. Where's my briefcase? I'll go. I'll go grab it. It's a pair. Of, they they look like typical earbuds, uh, but they cost a lot more. They're around three hundred bucks for the pair. Um, and I plug I plug them into a device that generates pink noise, um, either the actual computer I'm using or I just have pink noise on my phone. Just plug that in. Listen to pink noise. Play pink noise in the left channel and go. How does it sound? And if it sounds close to the same, you're getting really close. And if it sounds close to the same, you deserve to go get yourself a little chocolate because you got really lucky nice. because most of the times it won't. And once in a while it does. And then you go, wow, that sounds the same. And you continue and you hit play on your favorite album. You're like, wow, that's that's amazing. It it sounds great. So that's a, that's a trick. Uh, so what you're doing is you're feeding reference pink noise down through a, an auditory or through an audiology grade transducer that's got head related transfer function correction for those of you who knows what that means so what it's feeding down your canal is the same as if there was pink noise fed from a speaker going to your head and you compare the two it's amazing and if it don't sound the same now what do you do matthew then you go in and make some adjustments make some adjustments so matthew what would you do so let's say you just do this and you go well it didn't sound the same. Uh, you you notice there's a little bit more upper mid range or something. There, wh what would you do? Well, you could certainly go in and, and just do as I mentioned earlier per content editors. Or if it's something you know where you say, hey, maybe it extends a little past this, you could actually go in and create some EQ for it. You could have you know a little shelf that might go right there, a really wide band PEQ that's going to adjust a decent portion of the frequency response. Right. Um, really, there's a lot of different approaches that you could take, and none of them are necessarily, you know, right or wrong compared to each other. Right. So what I've usually found is if there are differences, they're not narrow band differences. They're, they're not that little thing that you're seeing either manually or automatically that are little peaks and dips. They're they're broad balance things, one or two octave wide that are just not did not come out right because what you're hearing in this room is not matching with the microphone measure. So what I like to do is go grab a, a band of wide band pink or, or, or a, a band of PEQ about one octave wide and start moving it back and forth and go, you know, is any of that kind of what I heard in the difference between my reference headphones and the speakers? And you may find it. It's like, well, yeah, centered on 800 hertz, a little less over here, a little more or whatever. You just slide it up and down. So, um, Anthony, a great, a great point on that is some speakers, when you're flush mount speakers, they don't, the designer does not compensate for SBIR effects. Yeah. And you could see when it's up against that boundary, you have a huge bump in the two to 400 hertz range with a low Q filter. You could bring that down 60 yep. B and you could totally fix that problem. And, and hopefully your equalization system has fixed that. So in the, at this part of the conversation, I'm, I'm assuming that we're talking about what we do after we've either hit the proverbial button in Dirac or any of the other uh, EQ systems or done a manual EQ, but without listening, just same thing. Just I'm working to draw a target curve on my computer, which is ultimately what either a manual EQ or an automated EQ is trying to do. Um, right. So at this point we go, it don't sound the same as my reference thing. Uh, what do I do? Well, grab a band and move it around. In the case of Matthew's product, you can either change the target curve. You can go and edit the target curve and go, let's recalculate this and let's see what it sounds like. Uh, this is the target curve in Dirac. Or really cool, you can go into the manual EQ, which overlays on top of that and start moving bands around and go, can I get it to sound the same? Yeah, so Nobody Matthew, quick, 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 you quick question after you. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Matthew, if I if I went in and I did all my PEQ stuff before I ran D rack and I got things sounding really good, but now I want to run D rack, can I keep the PEQ filters that I created first and then overlay D rack on top of that? So the answer is yes, and it really depends on where you start from in the actual configurator when you go into the Dirac calibration mode. So the way Storm Audio does this is we have what's called profiles, and your profile is essentially your calibration. 
And whatever you have built into that profile, as far as EQs, whether that's, you know, high pass, low pass shelves, actual, you know, regular bell PEQs as we traditionally like to think about them um, and levels, if those are in place, they're gonna be taken into consideration by Dirac. And then they're going to be, you know, whatever Dirac outputs as that project file is going to be written over them. And then you can take it a step further and you can go in, do your verification as we've been discussing, and then go in and continue to make adjustments into the EQ afterwards. The oh, only okay. thing that you wanna be aware of is, you know, how, you know, your previous EQs that you've done before Dirac. So sometimes what I like to do is, you know, leave those separate and I'll make slightly, you know, new filters to adjust. Also, you know, paying attention so that I don't, you know, create any, you know, crazy phase offsets because of the filters. Because and you don't want to double those are in either. place. Right, exactly. So you've yeah. got to be aware of, of what you have in place and what you're doing. Um, but it's a it's one of those things that is a balance between art and science to a degree. Right. Right. And this is this is just like cooking. You can follow a recipe and not know what you're doing exactly. or if you cook if you've cooked enough, you know, you know, it says to do this, but I know that's a little too much or I need a little more of this. After some time, you develop that intuitive and an artful sense about how to do it. So right. that's, that's the, it's called, I guess they call that intelligence, right? So as a reminder, where we are at this point is we've hit the proverbial button or done an EQ. Um, I forgot to mention, and I guess we're going to get to it. Uh, Gene, how much more time do we have? I need to get a-, a Time range. is a luxury we don't have. How so. much more time do we have? about three minutes so what i'm three gonna suggest minutes. okay what, let's keep what moving. i'm gonna suggest is that we do a case study on a post calibration DRAC result in a separate live stream at a separate date when i could get both of you guys back on and we could actually do a case study if, if you guys okay. are game for that that would be amazing. amazing that would be really cool yeah let's let's go back to the presentation i'll finish this up so the uh, the idea is to use a reference so that you know what pink noise is supposed to sound like verify that you're getting there and then you can put those away. Just make sure that if you're starting with a left speaker, then make sure that the center sounds like it on, on wideband pink. Make sure that the right sounds like it on wideband pink. And and tune them until they sound the same. And yeah. processors that give you those handles are the ones I prefer. The ones that have both a combination of auto and manual EQ, like you just mentioned here, Matthew, is the right way to go. Now, in, in the level touch-up, Again, after you've equalized it to where things all sound the same, again, verify that the levels going around the room all are subjectively right. Go around the room and I, I can spend I can spend 15 minutes getting the perceived level of pink noise of the left and the center and the right and the side left and the side right, back left, back right, top left, right, just going around and around and around until it sounds like as I'm switching, it all sounds the same. And that is huge in terms of the sense, in the end, the sense of immersion and quality. I'm mm. going to mention this one last thing so that we can uh, go in here. Finally, what I call time synchronization, which is the fact that all of these speakers are generating sound that's, that hits your head perceivably the same. Um, the way I like to do it is this. Once, once, once I get all of the spectra and the levels of all the channels the same, I listen to the left and right speakers playing pink noise and I wanna hear an image right down the middle. Yeah. If, I'm, mm -hmm. if I wanna compare if it's really good, I'll sometimes flip the polarity of one speaker and hear that there's a giant hole in the middle. And then you can adjust the delay of one or the other until it sounds like it's right in the middle or do other corrections which we don't have time to do next if i, I could if i could make one interjection i know we're short on time this is actually something that's also really important to check when you come out of the backside because i've seen cases with dirac and with other you know automated uh calibration processes where they may have you know 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 milliseconds this difference in the speakers between your left and your right channel in, in a pure dedicated theater where everything's been designed, you might have a little skew of your imaging and you right. might have to make that adjustment and add that back in. Right, yep. and and yep, why, it's, why it's wrong or why it's different is that the measurement device is looking at what's called an impulse response. It's trying mm -hmm. to find where the peak of the pulse was and it could be off by 0.1 millisecond or 0.2 millisecond. You go, you go, why are you arguing? That's nothing. It's like, nope, it could be everything in terms of the accuracy of imaging, either between the left and right or also, the left your and ears center. Are not, your ears are not in the same location as that microphone right. either. And, and to get that they right, may, really strong may not phantom be. center, right. it's a very narrow area. Usually. So I like to listen to a left and center image and either with a test disc or another free plug to the storm is you can actually go in there and say, give me pink noise in the left and center. 
and listen for the image. And then, and then you go around in pairs all the way around. And, and with the storm processor or the TK51 test disc, you can do that. And you can just play it in pairs. Once all of the speakers have the same sounding pink noise in reference to your ear, one, two, they all they are all the same level, and the images in pairs all the way around. You hit your movie and you're gonna be like, wow, that is so amazing. It's really cool. Now, final thing you should do is listen through a bunch of program material. Sorry, that's the final check, is listen to those that program material, listen to those eight elements of quality that I mentioned. And oh, really important, if you're actually doing a calibration, if if you are reading that you're it, sitting through this webinar because you're a professional, give a demo to the customer. I can't believe how many times people go, okay, I'm done calibrating, they pack up and they leave and the customer's That's never crazy. heard the demo. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, 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 the, the, show them how amazing their new race car is. Yeah, yeah. The, the customer might have a slight variation in preference, you know, they might prefer, for example, yep. you know, when people buy sports cars, one of the things they do on them is they put exhaust. Some people like yep. the exhaust to be a little bit louder. You know, it's the same application for this. Yeah, um, but most of the times they're really happy with the result. And until you give them the demo with the right program material, they have no idea how good it is. Because they may switch over to watching something on YouTube that sounds horrible. And they're like, I just paid for all this? No, 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 dude. Here's yeah. the right program material. OK. All right, so we have to we have to run because we have the really important loudspeaker specifications uh, webinar coming up at 6 o'clock, which is in 15 minutes. I would love to have both of you guys back on so we could do an actual case study. We could take someone on a process where the DREC was run. We could look at the post calibration results and look at the tweaks that had to be done to improve the sound. Anthony, you probably have a million of these stored in REW or in your bag of tricks, whatever you use to measure and analyze rooms. We could sit down and spend an hour just doing that if you guys yeah. are game. Mm -hmm. Yep, and and we could do it live. Matthew's got a, a place where he can do some measurements. I've got two, depending on how you look at it, as I say, two listening spaces where you can run some measurements and look at the results. Um, okay. And then Matthew and I can actually do a little live uh, jamming yep. on online when yeah. he buys the same guitar I just bought. Awesome. Absolutely. So let's, let's oh, I like that, actually. We could do that in the outtakes. Let's plan on that, guys. You're not going to know about this unless you're subscribed to this channel and you hit that bell notification. I make the announcements well in advance. Sometimes I make the announcements within a day of the advance. It really depends on the schedule of Anthony and, and Matthew as well. Um, so if you're not subscribed to the channel, you're going to miss out, and we don't want you to miss out. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. Anthony, Matthew, really appreciate you guys putting forth this effort today to do these webinars for us. I know this is invaluable information and you guys have limited time and we definitely want to have you back. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.